How many trust the Lord? Hallelujah. You know, I've come to the conclusion that I don't need to understand everything in order to trust him. And that demanding to know all the reasons why isn't trust. So I'm not entirely sure why we're down here instead of up at Mount Lehman today, but I'm okay. <laughs> and I'm eagerly looking forward to September 10th, which happens to be our fall kickoff Sunday. And I'm thinking, what better way to kick off the fall than with a picnic? So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll trust the Lord and see what he's, um, he's going to do, both here this morning and uh, throughout the rest of August and into September. So Brian and Brayden shared last week. Uh, my wife and I were away with our children. Um, it's kind of hard to call your kids when they're taller than you children, but I guess they still are. Our children. <laughs> and uh, we, were, we were, uh, went away. We went down the Oregon coast, and uh, it was super fun. We um, got in the water, which was chilly, but uh, the place we were staying, they had wetsuits, and, you know, I was out there riding the waves. Ooh, I just love eight-foot waves. And it's so exhilarating when they pick you up and smash you into the sand. No. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just good family time, and... Uh, good food, and um, I had to fix my van on the way down um, before we went down because it was having some issues, and then we put 1,600 clicks on the van going all the way down, and, and then coming back, we got into, uh, just into Bellingham, so we're almost home, and all of a sudden, the muffler separates, like right under the engine, like not way at, at the back, right there, we turned into the loudest hot rod you have ever heard. Oh, we were laughing so hard, we were almost crying, and uh, everybody would be like looking because they would be expecting to see some low rider, you know, jazzed up vehicle or whatever. Here's a minivan. <laughs> People were literally laughing. They'd look over and they'd see us and they'd just start laughing. So it's okay because we were laughing. But I was, uh, I was, I went online and I, I was watching the service from last week and uh, um, I don't see Braden here this morning. Maybe I know some people are out camping and whatnot, but I was really blessed with the word that he brought last week. Amen. Wasn't it good? And, uh, you know, for those of you who weren't there or for those of you who were there and, and it's maybe a little foggy, um, he was speaking about taking courage when you're feeling discouraged. You know, well, I feel discouraged. Well, the scripture says take courage. So... God's emphasis is you reach out and lay hold of what you need. Take courage. Like it's something tangible that you can actually take hold of. A lot of people say, oh, I feel so bad. And God's response to how we feel is to give us his word. Right? Like he says to Joshua, he says, be strong, be brave. Be very courageous. Different people, when they have an encounter with the Lord or, or with angels in the Old Testament, even in the New, Scripture says that they're usually very afraid and they're on their face shaking. And then Jesus will come and he will say, do not be afraid. Well, how do I not be afraid? <laughs> like, how do I not be afraid? In the Word is the power to have what Jesus tells you. You say, really? Yeah, think about it. He says to the blind man, see, and the power to see is in the word. He says to the lame man, pick up your mat and walk. Well, excuse me, I've been crippled for like so many years. Yes, the power to no longer be crippled is in the word, in the word of God. Take up your mat and walk. How? By faith, receive the strength that comes through the word. Take courage. Let me tell you something. God has courage for every single one of us here today. God's not up there going, yeah, you're afraid? Well, I got nothing for you. I mean, I got courage, but I'm not offering it to you. No, he's offering courage to every single one of us. And it's up to us to take what he's offering, to receive it. And then the command that Jesus gave to the women, which I don't imagine would have been too terribly difficult to follow after he was raised from the dead, the angels 
the, the women had come to the tomb. They'd seen the angel with uh, the face like lightning and the clothes like snow um, or like wool. Either way, white but not glowing. His face was glowing. And uh, all of the soldiers were very afraid. And then the, and the angel said, hey, he's risen. Go and tell Go and tell, go and tell, go and tell the disciples. So on the way, they meet Jesus, and the first thing Jesus says to them is rejoice. <laughs> you guys know what scripture goes, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, 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 and again I say rejoice, 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 and again I say rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, always rejoice. Well, except for when I'm having a really bad day. <laughs> Always rejoice. Well, how do I do that when I don't feel good? By faith, receive the power that's in the word to change your situation. See, faith doesn't follow feelings. Feelings follow faith. I choose to believe the word, and as I stand on the word and confess the word, my feelings line up with the word. I don't go, well, I don't feel good, so I guess I must not be good, and I guess everything must be lousy, and I guess I'm going to have a bad day. Well, actually, your day is going to follow your word. <laughs> See, feelings always follow faith. You just have to make sure you put your faith in the right things. Don't put your faith in your, cir in your current circumstances. Put your faith in the word of God. I was really encouraged um, to take courage. As I was watching um, Braden share, as I watched him minister, and he was declaring the names of God and getting himself excited. David in the Bible encouraged himself in the Lord. How many of you ever do that? How many of you ever encourage yourself in the Lord? Oh, we need to see more hands. Listen, seriously, when you're having a, a bad day, when you're having a rough time, get somewhat alone because when you're around other people and you really begin to encourage yourself in the Lord, people think you're strange. I mean, if you're really taking it seriously. For me, it's perfect because I can drive a vehicle. I know not everybody necessarily drives a vehicle. Hopefully you have a reasonably soundproof bathroom or something. But get somewhere where you can make some noise and begin to declare the word of God over your situation. Loudly. And it's important that that there is an element of, I want to say silliness, but I'll change and say childlikeness that comes into your declaration. See, it's hard to be depressed when you're laughing. It's hard to be depressed when you're in an uninhibited way declaring the goodness of God. So I'll get in my car, you know, when I feel warfare or different things begin to happen, and I'll start declaring the word of the Lord, and I'll start laughing and shouting. And if anybody could hear me, they'd think I was a maniac. But I've learned from the best because this is Pastor Ken. This is Pastor Ken. If you are ever in this church, when Pastor Ken is in this church and there's not a whole bunch of people and Pastor Ken thinks he's alone, it's crazy. He'll, he'll, he'll come walking into this church into the sanctuary. Here we go. Kenneth Charles Andrew Gretter, you're a good man. I don't care what the devil has to say. You're amazing. You're talented and good looking and everything. He's just constantly encouraging himself. And he's and he's just marching up and down. He used to be in that office. I'm in that office now. And he would come in. This was back when we, uh, we just had one pastor. And he'd be up in that office and he would spend two hours praying I call it praying, but it's different than how most of us pray. <laughs> oh, Lord, things are so bad. That's how we tend to pray. He's not telling God the problem. He's having a fit, a benefit. 
That's what he's doing. He's just up there, and he is just shouting and laughing and going off in tongues and praying. And this would often, he would tell me, sometimes there would be so many problems in the church, and I would say, I don't know how to solve any of that stuff. I'm just going to go pray for two hours. He said, by the time I come out of my office, 80% of them would already be dealt with. They just, fi- they just fix themselves. They just take care of themselves all on their own. We need to learn how to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Now, maybe you're not the Pastor Ken loud shouting kind, but that's okay. You be free to be the personality that you are. But if you really have the joy of the Lord, then at some point you have to notify your face. Some of you maintain that you have the joy of the Lord, but honestly, it's like, I'm not convinced, (laughs) right? There's got to be some level of expression of, of, wow. Do you know the definition of pessimism? If you actually look in the the dictionary, the actual definition of pessimism is the core belief that the world is ultimately evil and that evil will ultimately triumph. That's the core definition of pessimism in the dictionary. And the definition of optimism is that the world is ultimately good and the good will ultimately triumph. So by that definition, which is the dictionaries, we should all be optimists because we're all believers, right? And we know that good will ultimately triumph. There's no place for for pessimism. There's no place for pessimism. Don't be pessimistic. Because we've read the end of the book and we win. We, we, we're going to go through sufferings and trials here, but even those things are necessary. Scripture says our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. It's the afflictions themselves that Scripture tells us are achieving for us the glory. If we suffer with him, we will also be glorified with him so that we actually need a certain amount of pain. Otherwise, we're going to get no glory. So it's, it, it's just win, win, win for believers. But it's not win, win, win for doubters. It's win, win, win for believers. As an active, ongoing function, not a label. Oh, I'm, I, I'm a believer. Really? What are you believing for? What are you contending for? A lot of people will call themselves Christians, but they're not actually believing for anything. Oh, well, they believe in God, so do the demons, and they tremble. We are believers because we believe in his word and in his promises. And like Mary, we say, be it unto me according to your word. Braden was talking about Abraham last week, who receives this word from God. Get out of here into the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great and mighty nation. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I will make you a great nation. God says to Abraham, I will make you great. And Abraham's in the land and the famine happens in the land. And Abraham goes, oh no, we better go down to Egypt. Otherwise we're going to die. Well, you can't die. God will turn stones into bread if necessary because you have to be alive in order for him to make you a great nation. (laughs) So at some point, seed has to come forth from your body and produce children. And if that hasn't happened yet, then there's no way you can die. So he goes down to Egypt, and then, of course, he tells his wife, lie to Pharaoh because you're really good looking, and they're going to kill me. Abraham, they can't kill you because you have the word of God. See, whenever we begin to get into doubt and fear and anxiety, it's because we've forgotten what he told us. We've forgotten his promise. How many here have a promise from the Lord? Come on. We're a prophetic church. How many here... Look in Scripture. If you don't feel like you've received a prophetic promise in so many words, how many of you believe from your reading of Scripture that God still has some things left to do in your life and that he's promised in his word to do them? Okay, so then we can all contend and we can all believe for us to finally get our act together and get it done, right? He is faithful who promised He will perform it. He will perform it. He will perform it. Speaking about Mary, Elizabeth said, Blessed is she who believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were spoken to her by the Lord. Hallelujah. We have promises in this house. 
I mean, I have promises as an individual, but corporately, we have promises of what God has said he wants to do in us and in this place and in this city. Now, if he says he wants to pour out his spirit in this place, then it, what business is it of mine to tell him, oh, no, please don't do it here? <laughs> Come on, that's false humility. If God says he, no, I'm not saying he only wants to pour out his spirit in this place. I believe he isn't going to pour out his spirit over the, the whole city. But if he said he will do it here and his glory will be manifest here, then who are we to disagree and argue with him? I don't want to argue with him. Hey, whatever you have for me and whatever you want for me, Lord, I'm happy to receive. Because your plans for me are better than my plans for me. So I want to speak prophetically for a moment here. I shared a couple weeks back that this is a season of rest and repositioning and realignment within the body of Christ. And the signs of it are everywhere. If you talk to people, if you hear about what's happening People are getting jobs. People are relocating. People are moving house. There's uh, getting new positions. There's, there, there's a shift in, and a changing that's happening. And God is bringing his people. He's wanting to bring his people into a place of alignment with his will and with his purpose. And into a place of rest in him. And it's really important that we enter into the rest of the Lord now. And I'll tell you why. Because the rest of the Lord doesn't mean that there's no activity. It just means there's no anxiety. And when we're out of alignment, there's this thing inside where we know, I'm not, uh, not it, it doesn't feel right, something's wrong, I, I'm not. But when we know that we know that we know that we're where God wants us to be and we're about his business, then we can come into a place of rest. And the Bible says, great peace have those that love thy law. He wants to bring us into peace. And the reason is, is because the winds of change are beginning to blow. The winds of change are beginning to blow. And they're going to disrupt the natural order. They're going to disrupt the way things have been. Things that were planned will not be able to go ahead. For example, the wind started blowing, and all of a sudden, here we are instead of up at Mount Lehman. Because the winds are blowing. For some, the winds will bring rain. For the others, like those in the interior, they're not excited about the winds coming because the winds fan the flames. And the winds of change are blowing and have been blowing and are blowing and are going to increase in, in fierceness. But God does not want you to be blown away with what is going on in the world. God does not want you to be blown away by the winds of change. If your security is in familiarity, then you're not in a safe place. If your security is your job, um, the current economic climate in Canada, our, our government, our relative peace, which, you know, it's not as much of as there was maybe even a few years ago. If your security is based on things you can see and things that have been the way they have been, then it's a false peace and as the winds of change continue to blow in the earth, as there's talk of wars and, and, and rumors of wars, in Matthew 24, verse 6, Jesus said, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. Well, how, how do I not be troubled? The power is in the word. <laughs> Jesus says, don't be troubled. <sighs> Thank you. I'm not now because you said don't be. For all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet. Do not put your security in familiarity, but in Christ who is the word made flesh. The winds of change are going to blow, and you're going to remember this, and you're going to remember this message. You're going to remember this word in weeks and months and perhaps years to come. And you're going to be reminded by the Lord, I need to focus on you. I need to put my confidence, my security all my eggs need to be in one basket. It's called, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It's in your relationship with God, your alignment with Him, your open-handedness with regards to your possessions, your positions, your preferences. 
that you have no other agenda than simply being directed by him and his purposes and his agenda. That doesn't mean that you don't plan. Scripture says you can make plans. Just make sure that you say, if it be the Lord's will, we will go here and do this and go there and do that. But you need to have open hands with regards to the earthly things, the worldly things. And we need more and more to be focused on eternity. We need to be more and more focused on the return of Christ and on making sure that we have oil in our lamps, that we are about our Father's business, that we are living for that which endures, not that which passes away. And so the Lord wants to say to us, don't be blown away by the winds of change. You hear, you hear Christians say crazy things all the time. Oh, did you hear about what's going on with North Korea? Unbelievable. And I'm like, don't say that. Don't say unbelievable. If there's one word that should not come out of the mouth of believers, it's unbelievable. I mean, come on. Thomas in the Bible said, I'm not going to believe unless I see it. Right? Right? And then Jesus shows up and goes, Thomas, come on, put your fingers, stop doubting and believe. Thomas falls to his knees, says, my Lord and my God. Jesus says, sure, now you believe because you have seen. But blessed are they which believe when they have not seen. We're one worse than Thomas. Something amazing will happen and we'll stare at it and go, unbelievable. We're even seeing it and we're still declaring it unbelievable. No, it's important what we say. Don't say unbelievable. Because we're believers. That's what we do. People, they'll come to me and go, hey, man, you'll never believe what happened. And I'll go, just a second, before you go any further. Yes, I will, because I'm a believer, and that's what I do. <laughs> Don't tell me I won't believe something. Now, I'll check it up against the word, but I'm not going to doubt. I believe every testimony, and I give glory to God for all the wonderful testimonies of healing and miracles and, and faith that Colin shared from his, his growing up years, from his life. I've experienced supernatural healing in my body. I've laid hands on the sick and seen them recover. I've cast out devils. I have not yet raised the dead. Note the word yet. But I've laid hands on dead people. Three or four of them. <laughs> I, don't just mean, I don't just mean lukewarm Christians. I mean people who are actually dead. <laughs> And I've commanded life to come in. You say, well, yeah, but you haven't raised any dead people. Yeah, but I can be guaranteed not to raise any if I don't pray for them. <laughs> and you won't raise any, you, you will not raise every dead person you don't pray for. <laughs> Hallelujah. So take that to heart, church. The winds of change are blowing. God does not want you to be blown away. There is a shaking that is coming, but the Lord promises that the righteous will not be shaken. He'll shake everything else. Economic systems, you know, religious freedom, all of these things will be shaken. But he who is founded upon the rock will not be shaken. And he, is, he who is moving with the wind of the Holy Spirit will not be blown away because he'll be in the wind. Ooh, that sounds exciting. All right. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Turn there in your Bibles. Hallelujah. I may let you out early to go and have a picnic somewhere. <laughs> Amen. Come on, Sefo. Amen. Next time someone tells you that, unbelievable, you just say, all things are possible to those who believe. Yeah, in that voice. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Title of, t of the, yeah, that first part was for free. The title of today's message is Finding Yourself in Praise, Thanksgiving, and the Prayer of Faith. Finding Yourself in Prayer, Thanksgiving, and the Prayer of Faith. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 says, Therefore, by him, meaning Christ, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Let us continually offer 
the sacrifice of praise. We're hearing about that. uh, Braden was speaking about that last week as well. And the Lord was speaking about that to me as well. Um, for, For us for this week, that we look for ourselves. How many feel occasionally... Um, not yourself. You feel like there's times when you're yourself and there's other times when you're like, I don't feel like me. And sometimes I say, Lord, I feel spiritually schizophrenic. I feel like some days I'm crazy on fire for you. And then other days I feel like such a wimp spiritually. I feel like, oh, you know, I I, I feel so up and down. And you say, wow, like, will the the real Mike stand up? (laughs) Which one is the real me? Which one is the real me? The one that's, you know, here at an awakening or, or at a prayer meeting just shouting in tongues and praying and laying hands on the sick? Or the one that's lying in bed at 5 a.m. when the alarm goes off and I need to get up and pray and goes, oh, I'm too tired. I, don't, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So which one is the real me? You ever, you ever wonder that? If you look back, especially those of you who are a little older, we'll say 40 and older, but yeah, even you 20 and 30s, if you look back over your life, you can undoubtedly remember times when you were passionately on fire for God, when you were filled with hope and, and faith and a sense of victory, and you can also remember times when you were probably hugging the porcelain throne and, uh, and not feeling so victorious. Or you were just really sick or, or, or you were really struggling in areas of finances or what. And so you go, well, which is the real me? How do I find myself and how do I get a hold of myself and not lose myself in the midst of life's problems and challenges and hardships and trials? Well, here's the key right here. We find ourselves in praise. The real me is the one that is praising God. That's not hype. That's not some, you know, oh, he's like overly optimistic. I don't know that you can be. People say, well, you need to be a realist. Yeah, God's a realist. He calls those things that are not as though they are, and then they become what he calls them. Realism is simply believing the whole Bible and everything it says about God, you, and the world. That's realism. And according to that, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. All things that we have need of, God has given to us. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, who focus on the Word of God and living out of that place. I find myself in praise. When I'm depressed, I'm half me. That's not the real me. The real me is the one who's praising God. The real me is the one who is thanking God. And the real me is the one who is praying the prayer of faith. So anything less than that, and I'm, 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 I'm trading away parts of, my ident- parts of my identity for the temporary comforts of self-pity, apathy, lethargy. I know I'm using big words here. Think about it. When you don't get in your car or do whatever works for you in order to bring yourself out of the doldrums, when you don't do whatever you you need to do in order to choose to take courage and begin to manifest the kingdom, why do we do that? Well, because it's work, right? My dad used to say, he says, prayer is work. And the people who will tell you, no, it's not, prayer is not work. Really? So how many hours a day are you praying? (laughs) Now, I believe it can come to a place where it becomes such a joy, but the process of getting there, like Smith Wigglesworth says, he says, when I don't feel anything, I just start praying in tongues for 30 minutes, uh, for 30 minutes, and someone says, isn't that starting in the flesh? He said, I am in the flesh. I don't know how to get into the spirit other than by starting in the flesh. I'm a human being living in the flesh. I got to make a choice, and I got to choose to do what I know is right regardless of what I feel, because just doing what you feel like doing is certainly not living in the spirit. That's just very much living according to the flesh. So, so we, when we choose to praise and we choose to worship God, we are reclaiming our spiritual identity. And when because of apathy, laziness, um, um, discouragement, doubt, I think I'd rather magnify my problems than the Lord of glory. 
Why? Well, because it's easier. These problems are big, and that person so hurt me, and I'm so mad at what they did, and, uh, and I can't figure out how God could bring good out of this, and, and if he does, that means I'll have to forgive them, and I don't want to forgive them. They hurt me, and I, want to, I just want to hang on. Um, Pastor Keith Abrahams, uh, who uh, was a mentor for myself and my wife and, and ordained us in this church, he had this beautiful expression. He said, he said, um, offenses and hurts and wounds are like fungus. They're like mushrooms. And self-pity is the canopy that we erect over the fungus of our offenses because they need shade in order to grow. But if you rip off the canopy of self-pity and let the full beaming bright sunlight beam down, they don't like that. They shrivel up. We need to let the light of God's word shine on the fungus of our offenses and our grievances and our he hurt me, she hurt me, they did this, they stole from me, it's not fair, and all that stuff. Because you know what? Grumbling and complaining is not your identity. How many think we're going to spend any time grumbling and complaining in heaven? Raise your hand. I almost saw a hand go up over there. <laughs> There is no grumbling in heaven. So the you that is going to be in heaven is the youest you there is. That's probably not good grammar, Mr. Carey, but go with me on that. The you that is praising and worshiping God. Listen, when we get saved, we start our walk with Christ in praise. You see a person, a brand new believer who gets saved, they are so like, so thankful, so on fire, so like, God is so good. I mean, I'm, I've, I've messed up so bad. You mean he saved me and there's forgiveness? He takes all the wrong things I've done and there's, there's tears of joy and gratitude. So we begin our walk in Christ in praise for his goodness. And I promise you that those who finish it will finish it in the same heart and mind. We begin it in praise, and we're going to spend eternity in praise. And it's only in between, in the middle, that we have this testing of our faith. Where the Lord allows trials and challenges to come to see if, we've, to see if we know the way home. I know the way home. It's hallelujah. Do you know what hallelujah means? Anybody know what hallelujah means? It means celebrate. The word hallelujah means celebrate. Do you know what Yah is? It's his name. Hallelujah means celebrate God. So when you say hallelujah, you're saying celebrate God. You're getting excited. You're praising God because he's still worthy. I was, I was talking with a brother this past week who was going through some real depression and I was encouraging him. I was just saying, get back into praise. Here's why. No matter what you're going through, God is still worthy. I've preached a lot of messages. I've done a lot of talking. You tend to do that as a pastor. A lot of counseling. And undoubtedly, I've made many mistakes in what I've said. Because scripture says, in many words, there are many mistakes. So please don't listen to this thinking that, I'm always right. Scripture requires you to go home and check the scriptures to make sure that what I'm saying is according to scripture. But listen, there's one thing that I can do that is never wrong. I can say, God, you are good and you are worthy of praise. And every syllable, every nugget and nanosecond of sound that came out of my lips was in complete harmony with heaven. He's always worthy. You're never going wrong by praising him. No matter what else you've said that's been incorrect, no matter even if you've told lies, and we've all told lies, no matter what sins you have committed, you're always right by praising God. He's always worthy. That's never, well, I don't know if I, maybe I'm praising God too much. There's no such thing as praising him too much. Amen. Come on. I appreciate the support. Yeah. From the mouth of babes and sucklings, God has ordained strength and perfected praise. Shuka. Listen, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Randy, you sent me this this morning. And it just happened to completely fit into the word of God that the Lord was giving me for today. It says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. 
Because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. We thank God without ceasing. Honestly, guys, in this day and age, we do not lack things to thank God for. I have... I'm gonna, I'll be a little bit transparent. Sometimes I have a little bit of a hard time when I get in prayer meetings and people aren't praying because there's so much to thank him for. And when we thank him, it changes the atmosphere. It edifies us and it edifies the hearers. But I can't do all the praying in a prayer meeting because that doesn't, other people aren't being edified. So just go off the wall and begin to thank God. If you're in a prayer meeting and it's becoming a boring prayer meeting, it's because you're boring and the people in the meeting are boring. So don't be boring any longer and start being excited about the goodness of God and start just looking around and going, wow, that is like the most gorgeous window. Look at the size of the crown molding there and the beautiful pattern in the glass and the shape of it. Thank you, God. Thank, and, and the valance up there with the lights and the gold. This is a beautiful place in which to gather together and worship our Father. Wow, thank you that you gave us the funds. This whole renovation cost us like 80 grand. That's $80,000 that God gave to us just because he wants to show us how powerful he is and how good he is. And because beautiful things matter to him because he's the author of all beauty. Get a little bit excited about this amazing world that we live in. A number of years ago when they redid the Mount Lehman interchange, I was driving through there because before they redid that interchange and put in all those overpasses and before they built High Street and everything, around 5 o'clock, it was a horrible place to have to try and navigate because it was back up city. I mean, it was just like crawling and everybody's getting mad and everything. And then they put in this interchange. Do you know how many millions of dollars it cost to put in all of those highways and roads and everything? And I was driving through there, and I was going, God, thank you for the grace that this interchange is bringing to our lives and all of those who have to drive their vehicles over these overpasses and on and off the freeway. Thank you. How many? I've been in Kampala, Uganda, and I've tried to drive the roads there. Come on, Luke. Come on, Luke. (laughs) Luke as well and Suzanne. I mean, money is given by the government to contractors to fix the roads, and there's so much corruption, they just pocket it, or they fix them, but they use the wrong products, so they fall apart in months. And after you've crawled through traffic for hours to try and go a couple of miles in those places, you come back here, and you don't take our roads for granted. I don't take it for granted. I praise God for the Mount Lehman interchange. (laughs) Whole bunch of concrete. I'm like, thank you, Lord. This is beautiful. This is well thought out. Thank you that you gave engineers and city planners the wisdom and the understanding to know how to design and develop this. Thank you for our medical system. Thank you for, 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 for dentists. My wife grew up in Croatia, and over there, if you went to see the dentist, they didn't book appointments. People didn't go to the dentist until it was critical because nobody liked the dentist. You just sat in a room with a bunch of other people, and they would come out, and they go, next. And they would take you in, and they would crank the music really loud because they didn't use freezing unless you were getting a tooth pulled. They just drilled you. And you come over here, and we complain about going to see our dentist. Guys, it could be much, much worse. Let's not grumble. Let's give thanks. Let's find ourselves in gratitude. You know, you can't have a spirit of entitlement If you have a spirit of gratitude. If you are thankful, then pride and arrogance and entitlement goes right out the window. Listen, you're going to find your spiritual identity. Maybe you're feeling a little spiritually flat. You're like, well, we don't have an an awakening anymore. And I just don't know. And look at all the things going on in the world. And now North Korea, maybe it's going to fire on us or Guam. Or I don't even know where Guam is. But things are bad. And we should just be sad. And so we should complain and grumble and groan. No. God is on the throne. Jesus said wars are going to happen. Don't be concerned about that. Praise and worship me. Keep your focus on me. I have promised to bring you into my Father's house in which are many dwelling places. I will bring you there. 
We have become, past tense, partakers of Christ if we, present tense, hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm until the end. That's the true believers. Not just the ones who had an encounter with God, but the ones who know the way home. Home is he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And he's not under there complaining and whining and groaning. He's resting in his Father's love and in his Father's shepherding. Psalm 50, verse 23. Turn there in your Bibles. This is a, uh, <laughs> an amazing and somewhat terrifying passage of Scripture. <laughs> If, if, if you're reading the whole thing there, let, let's just go back a couple of verses. So go to Psalm 50, and then let's go back to verse 15. Psalm 50, verse 15 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Verse 16, But to the wicked, God says, what, have right, what right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth, seeing how you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him and have become a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. So that's the preface leading up to the next scripture. And he says to the wicked, listen, to the wicked, he says, Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Consider what? Consider this. Whoever offers praise glorifies me. To the wicked, the Lord says, consider this. Listen, you guys who are messing up. Listen, all of you who are forgetting God. That's like us as believers when we heard the promise like the one given to Abraham and we're, oh, God's going to do all of this stuff in my life and then we just micro down instead of staying macro, we micro down onto all the little problems and challenges in our lives and we forget God, how big he is. And he says to them, listen, whoever offers praise glorifies me. See, that's when even when I know I've messed up, I can begin to worship. And I know it's right. Even the wicked get told, listen, here's a remedy for some of what you're doing. The other is, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show my salvation. But part of the remedy is there is start by honoring me. Start by praising me. Start by glorifying me. And watch it begin to change your mindset and your attitude. Watch it begin to change the atmosphere around you. So I'm going to finish up here in just a few minutes. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. It says, the promise of rest. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, let us be concerned, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. He's speaking about all the children of Israel in the wilderness that were brought out of Egypt with the ten plagues and the parting of the Red Sea and the whole bit and all the, uh, the Egyptians destroyed. And God's feeding them with manna in the wilderness. He's speaking to them. He's giving them the ten commandments. They're seeing his power manifest. And it says the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. The word, be saved. Wow, I receive salvation. Be healed, I receive healing. See, walk. Be cleansed of leprosy. Be raised from the dead. Somehow, I'm not entirely sure how, I guess it was, it was the faith of Christ but the Lord spoke to the dead body of Lazarus and raised him from the dead. God can raise you out of whatever situation you are in. But will, it be, will his word be mixed with faith when it's spoken to you? 
Jesus said, but when the Son of Man returns, will he really find faith? Will he really find those who will believe in his word? And when you believe in his word, then confess it. Not just inwardly, don't just, um, yeah, don't, not mental assent. Confess with your mouth God's word over you. And believe in your heart and you shall be saved. What's the scripture that says, that says um, don't say he, he's over there or, or he's over here. The word of salvation is near you even in your mouth. Do you know that your praise and your thanksgiving is actually tied to your salvation? It's actually tied to your confession. The word of salvation is near you. Yeah, where? Has Brian got it? Maybe Pastor Ken. Braden's anointed. Where's the preacher who can give me in your mouth? Come on, everybody say, my mouth. My the mouth. word of salvation is in my mouth. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to magnify the Lord and minimize my problems, not magnify my problems and minimize the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, we're going to look at one more scripture, and then I have a real key that will help you understand why you don't see the results that you want as fast as you want them. Turn in, uh, to James chapter 5 and verse 13. James chapter 5. Here is the remedy for every situation that we may find ourselves in. God has not left us to wander in the dark. Aren't you thankful for the word of God that speaks to everything that we can go through in life? It says here in James chapter 5 and verse 13, Is anyone among you suffering? I would venture to say that we probably in this room at this moment in time have some people in the house who are suffering in some way in their body. Yep, probably more, more than half. And scripture says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Let him pray. And by the way, the, don't tell God all about your pain and your suffering. Tell him about his bigness and his goodness and that his promise and that his arm is not short and that he cannot save. Because he knows just telling him the problem over and over and over again isn't prayer, it's complaining. It's whining. <laughs> and uh, God doesn't like it any more than parents like it when their kids whine. So you tell him, he knows about your pain, and you can talk about your pain, but like David in the Psalms, you'll notice that he never finishes the Psalms that start out with complaining and, oh God, I'm, my bones are all out of joint, and this is happening, and the wicked are like bulls of Bashan, and all this stuff is going on. But at the end of the Psalm, he never goes, so it's a sucky day. <laughs> he doesn't finish there. He comes through and goes, nevertheless, I will trust you. Those who hope in you will not be ashamed. I know that you will save me. I know that you will vindicate me. He always comes through to praise and faith. And we need to be the same. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. We got anybody here full? We got anybody here full who's cheerful? Awesome. Praise the Lord. Good, then we can sing songs and sing them loudly and joyfully. Let, uh, is anyone among you sick? Listen, there's nothing wrong with admitting that you're sick because otherwise you couldn't call for the elders of the church. <laughs> it says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. There's not a problem with admitting you're sick. There's a problem with going, and I guess I'm just supposed to stay this way. No, acknowledge that you have a pain or a condition and then say, and I'm going to follow in the words of Scripture and ask for the elders of the church and ask for you to pray for me. And by faith, I receive my healing and I'm made whole. And then keep standing on that and declaring it until it manifests. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. You have the promise right here. We stand on it. And the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, we're going to talk, we're going to finish up by talking about the economy of heaven and the economy of the kingdom of this world. The world functions on a buy sell economy. And it's, for the most part, pretty instant. In fact, it's, it's gone so instant now. See, the more that you get instant gratification, the more you are brought into bondage. 
You guys are looking at me, as Ken would say, like a cow at a new gate. Like, where are you going? This is a tangent. It's not a tangent. The more, the more that you immediately get what your, what your flesh longs for, the more that there's a cost. There is a price that you pay. See, the kingdom of heaven does not function by buying and selling. You go to a store, you take some things you want, you give them money, they're yours right away. They're yours, and you can just eat them all or do whatever you want with them. The kingdom of, of heaven is different. The kingdom of heaven is sowing and reaping. You take your precious seed and you bury it in a hole in the dirt. Isn't that precious to you? Yeah, so I'm going to bury it in a hole in the dirt. And then what are you going to do? Nothing. I'm going to wait. <laughs> For how long? As long as it takes. <laughs> different kinds of seed take different amounts of time. And you wait, and the Bible says the farmer plants the seed, but God gives the increase. And why is this? His, his economy is so different from the world because buying and selling requires no faith, right? You give money, you get thing. Farming requires faith. <laughs> what if, and what, if, what about, and what? God, I'm at your mercy. I'm at the mercy of your weather and your winds and your, I mean, I can do some stuff with some irrigation, but at some point, you're the one who makes it grow. Here's what happens in our spiritual life, because in the spiritual life, it's all sowing and reaping. It's not buying and selling. It's all sowing and reaping. We begin to pray for something into a situation, but there's the wait. There's the divine delay. There's the waiting. If we prayed for every single person and they were instantly healed every single time, it wouldn't build faith inside of us. Healings, miracles are often instant, but healings are progressional. And if you study the healing revivalists, many times they'll be up there and they won't focus on the people who aren't getting healed right away. They'll just say, that's not my business, that's God's business. I've prayed the prayer of faith, and now I'm just going to move on and pray for the next one. And then at the end of the service, some of those people will come up, and they're, they've either experienced a healing by the end of the service, or they're experiencing a progressional healing as it goes, or maybe it's the next day, or, or a couple weeks later. I've experienced, I've experienced instantaneous miracles, and I've experienced progressional healing as well. So when we begin to pray in the Spirit, we are building spiritual equity. We are building spiritual equity. You say, well, where's that in Scripture? Remember when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration and he came down and his disciples, not Peter, James, and John, they went up with him, but the other disciples were trying to cast the devil out of this boy and they couldn't. And Jesus came down and the, and the father's like, if you can do something. And Jesus is like, if all things are possible to those who believe. He goes, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus cast it out. His disciples later said to him, why couldn't we cast it out? Jesus says, this kind comes out, but by prayer and fasting. You guys don't have any equity built up. I've got 18 years of equity. From the age of 12 at which he was ready to go and the, the Holy Spirit would not permit him to ditch his parents and just take off and start his ministry. He waited until he was 30 before the Lord released him. And, there were, and then there's the 40 days in the wilderness of fasting. He built up spiritual equity and faith for levels of miracles. There's miracles where I, I have faith to maybe pray for someone for something. But other things, you know, it's like Reese Howells, one of my favorite writers, um, great man of faith. The Lord took him on a whole journey where he gave him experiences and tests that he went through. And as he passed those tests, he came to a place where all of a sudden he had faith for TB. Before that, he didn't have a whole, a whole lot of faith for tuberculosis, but he was contending. He was declaring the word of God, and it was a major battle. And then he came through. And then after that, almost every single person he prayed for who had TB was very quickly healed. So we have to build up spiritual equity. So what happens is, is you're going through your life, you're in your situation, and you're like, okay, all right, so Pastor Mike says, I need to begin to praise God, and I need to begin to thank God, and I need to pray the prayer of faith. And you begin to do it, and you don't get the instant gratification that you do with the world system where it's buying and selling. And the reason is, is because in the spirit, in the hidden realm, the curve is beginning to go up. And I remember this happening because I was beginning to pray back in 2011 and 2012, I was beginning to pray for a number of our young people. And I was beginning to pray for the, for, for, for the culture of young people in general. And there were some people that I was praying for. And I would be praying and I would be contending. And nothing would be happening. And I would be praying for them for a week or two. And I'd be like, man, what's the matter? It's not working. And then I'd get kind of depressed and I'd stop praying. And about a week after that, 
all of a sudden, all these good things would start happening in their life. And I'd be like, oh, awesome. I guess it did work. Look at that. Wow. But I wouldn't start praying again. I'd just be like watching it. Look, look, it's, it's good. And then they would go back down again. And the Lord says, no, you pray and then you stay praying. Because the curve of the manifestation of your prayers is delayed because it's the kingdom of heaven. Sowing and reaping, right? You don't sow and then reap the next day. You sow and you wait on the Lord. So all of you parents who are praying for your children, all of you people who are contending for a spouse, I don't even know why I said that. I just felt to say that. Some of you are contending for a spouse. All of you people who have something that you're contending for and you pray and you don't get the immediate answer that you want, don't give up. Keep praying. Keep declaring. Keep standing. Keep contending because in the hidden realm, you are building up spiritual equity. And that curve follows the natural one. What does scripture say? First the natural, then the spiritual. So you begin to pray and begin to contend in the natural and the spiritual curve of your breakthrough is behind in the spiritual realm where you can't see but you go by faith. And as you stand and as you thank God and as you praise God and as you go, no, I thank you, Lord, that it's done. I shared with you guys a little while ago about the Lord healing my ear. And in the natural, it was I have received a rhema word, and I know that God has done the work, and I'm healed. And everybody's like, yeah, and awesome, so now can you hear? And I'm like, no, that's got absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with it. I have the rhema word, it's done. And I just keep contending and keep standing and keep declaring, and it was about a week later, after the doctor couldn't even find the hole anymore, I knew it was a lie, but after all of that, when all of a sudden I had continued to stand and declare, no, I've received it, I've received it, and boom, all of a sudden, then in the natural, it manifested. But we don't walk by sight, right? We walk by faith. So all of you who are in a place right now where, you know, we're in the summer and it's, uh, it's like, well, I don't know, it just feels like sort of a different season. It is a different season. God is changing the times and the seasons. And he's seeking to bring us into alignment with his spirit and with his purposes. And begin to declare over yourself the word of God. Begin to stay in that place of, as Braden said, rejoice. Well, how do I re rejoice, receive strength by faith in the spoken word of God. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Well, if you're rejoicing always, why would he need to say it again? I don't know, for emphasis. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And remember, the spiritual economy is different from the earthly one. We're like, God, I cried out to you. We're like, I texted you. Where, how come you're not answering God? And God's like, I texted you 2,000 years ago. It's a whole book. Read it. <laughs> right? It's called the text of Scripture. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Oh, that we would be a people of thanksgiving. Father, help us. We receive that help by faith, not to be grumblers and complainers. Lord, forgive us where we magnify problems. Lord, where we get caught out forgetting God. But you said, remember this, whoever offers praise glorifies me. Whoever offers praise glorifies me. Lord, that we would find ourselves in praise and thanksgiving and the prayer of faith. Lord, this is the real us that you saved. This is the real sons and daughters of the living God that will spend eternity praising and worshiping and glorifying you in your presence. And we thank you that we have opportunity to be that person now, Lord God. Father, we just break off all discouragement. Lord, every spirit of fear and worry and frustration and anxiety, Lord God, we break it off. It's not our portion. It's not our portion. All things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to your purposes. And I bless this body as they go in the afternoon. Thank you for the wind and the rain and the change in the weather. We pray grace on all those in the interior fighting the fires and safety for all of the first responders, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, we pray that you would give us more rain. And we praise and worship you for your faithfulness and your goodness. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody shouted. Amen. 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 Awesome. Okay, so you're blessed and released. And if we could have the uh, life group, the Mr. Carey reference, come forward. And we're going to pray for Diane. 
and Brian. Have a fantastic day in our God's good earth.